A huge thank you all for coming out because I know in October and someone asks me to go somewhere in October at half seven at night, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm already done. So thank you all for making the effort to come here tonight and for being here to celebrate what is a really special occasion. Um, the authors are all here, so Dr. Claire Rice. Um, Dr. Sophie Whiting, so just a, if you can just say a quick a wave to um, everyone. And also we have Professor Tong, um, and also we have Professor James McCauley, yes, formal terms, and Professor Thomas Hennessy. So the whole team is here tonight, so please take the opportunity to spend some time with us because there's nothing we love talking about <laughs> more than our research and everything that we're up to. Um, a big thanks to Ulster University for hosting us this evening and for taking and for all of the investment and a, a special shout out to our Pro Vice Chancellor Cathy Gormley-Heenan for being here this evening but also for all of the investment in the research that we're doing all of our team but um, but here at Ulster as well and a thanks to I've lost them now um, to my research director who um, took over um, duties as bar staff this evening. So um, a very able team and Amber wherever she's disappeared to, but a huge thanks to the Ulster University team as well. Um, I also want to say a big thanks to No Alibis. So um, No Alibis have been, this is our third book. So it's our third book together. Um, and it's our third book about political parties. And I know that some of you have been long-term fans might be putting it slightly strongly, but you have been um, big advocates of this research and research into political parties and what actually members aspire to, why they're engaged and why they're motivated into political life. And we've been 10 years, so 2014 was our first book, 2024 is our third. I'm not going to promise you all that it's our last, but um, it is our third book and it, it's, it is a special book. Our, this book on the Alliance Party, um, we couldn't have done it without the Alliance Party. We couldn't have done it without the members who gave up their time to do the focus groups, do the survey, and if anyone knows this lot, the survey was extensive. I don't know how many questions we asked, but it was, it was a lot of questions. So we do have a very detailed survey and it's in the book um, and it will be featured in lots of media over the coming weeks, hopefully. So I do want to extend my most grateful and on behalf of our team, the, most, the biggest thank you actually goes to all of the members who sat through the survey and sat through our focus groups and sat through all of our interviews and also then sat through going through all of their um, statements and poor Claire had to go back and make sure that all of those statements were correct so this book wouldn't have been possible without the Alliance Party. Um, a little bit about the running order tonight so John and Claire are going to give some highlights about the book and then we're going to move into a panel discussion so um, Fire drills should not happen. We should all be safe and sound. Um, but if we do need to exit the building, please just use some of the stairs. There's lots of stairs. And also, the other point that I would say is um, there is something special about this book. There's something special because it and the Alliance Party have opened themselves to democracy and have given us the opportunity to learn a little bit more about party structures and also how parties function and for all of my students who are here this evening and we have a lot of law politics social science students here this evening the very fabric of democracy we know is eroded day and daily so this is a an opportunity and again congratulations to the to the alliance party for letting us understand a little bit more and it is a testament to the statement, not only of their engagement with this book, but the statement of their engagement with political life, whenever political life is often difficult and democracy is difficult and challenging. And what 
my lesson, a tiny lesson from the book is, is that it's people who are willing to participate in democracy at times whenever democracy is is hard won and disenfranchised. So I'm now going to hand over to um, Claire Wright, or Claire, not two Claire's in the room tonight. So Claire Rice, um, who was our um, huge, she, she drove every interview, looked after every, she looked after everything on the project. And the, again, the book would be nothing without Claire. So I'm gonna hand over to Claire, who is our hardest little worker um, on the team and, um, and to John as well. So, but we will, I'll hand over to John and Claire and then John and Claire can hand over to Sophie and to the panel. So thank you all for being here. And I'm, thank you and welcome to Ulster. So thank you. Um, good evening. Um, I just want to begin by echoing Maura's welcome to you all this evening. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. I think we're all a bit blown away by the turnout that we have here this evening. Um, it's been a long, 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 long process to uh, get to this point. Um, going back several years, not just from when the funding was completed, but I've been saying to a few of you tonight, it's actually a year this month since I finished at Liverpool. So that will give you a, a, an idea of just how long we've been working on this project. Um, we're delighted so many of you have decided to be here this evening, as Moira said, and taking the time to join us for the official launch of our book, now that we finally have it here in print. Um, it's a book that comes from, as I mentioned, several years of research, and th th that was funded through several grants from the Economic and Social Research Council, the British Academy, and the Political Studies Association. It comprised a survey of over 2,000 people in Northern, Northern Ireland's electorate who self-identified as neither unionist nor nationalist, a survey of the Alliance Party's full membership, interviews with almost all of the elected representatives, albeit that changed quite significantly during the course of the project, um, with former leaders um, and, as Maura mentioned, a series of focus groups with members as well as a lot of archival research. So we've had our own roles within the team over the last number of years. And as Maura mentioned, I've had the particular privilege of being the project's research associate. Um, so from the party's perspective, I'm probably known to you all as that uh, annoying academic who's been pestering you all for several years, looking for interviews and focus groups, sorting out transcripts and everything in between. Um, of the almost 60 interviews that we conducted, I was sat across the table or on the other end of a screen for close to 50 of them and likewise for our six focus groups. And I don't overlook how privileged a position that was to be in and to be able to get to know the party and its members in that way. On a personal level, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to properly say thank you for persevering, uh, first of all, with my many emails and phone calls um, and for so graciously participating in the interviews and focus groups, for being so generous with your time, your views, your insights. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know the party and the people within it. And it was wonderful to be met with a genuine sense of curiosity about the research, about us as researchers, who we were, what we were doing uh, and what we were finding out along the way. So as a team, I think it's fair to say that we were humbled by the enthusiasm shown in this project and also by the trust that was placed on us in doing this research by everyone who took the time to contribute to it. So on behalf of our team, thank you to everyone who gave up their time to speak to us and helped us as we navigated this work. Um, it wouldn't be here today without all of your, your contributions. Over the course of this evening, we will be hearing about and discussing different takes on the findings of this research. And there will be different readings of what we cover in the book. Um, indeed, even the book itself is edited. It's a condensed version of our full body of research. And I don't think my colleagues will mind me saying that even within our team, there are different interpretations of some of the research that we have come across. But the aim of the book like this is to share our findings and to allow the readers to reach their own conclusions as to what is in there. It's for your own interpretation of the past for the party, the present for the party, and what all of that might mean for the future of it going forward. Now, it's more common than you might think, than, uh, than you might think for academic book launches to actually forget to speak about the books that are there to be launched. So I'm going to kickstart this evening's discussion um, of this work by mentioning just three aspects of the research that we found um, provided interesting insight on the Alliance Party and that became recurring themes across our research in the project and hopefully will help to shape some of the discussion as we go forward this evening. 
First of all is, of course, the constitutional question, that unavoidable uh, issue that's there pretty much eternally uh, by its absence within the party, um, and especially so given that our data shows that it doesn't feature even as a top 10 priority for the party um, currently. At no point in any of our engagements with the, the Alliance Party, either formal, formally or informally, was this posed as an issue that the party sees um, something it needs, as something that it needs to contend with. Um, certainly not in the here and now, at the very least. Um, to an extent, there's a degree of acceptance that it is something that will continue to, be uh, continue to be asked of the party until such a time as a position is indeed clarified. Yet even with that, and we cover this um, in more detail in the book, we see that there are significant uh, numbers within the party who feel that it shouldn't take a position at any stage on the constitutional question. So it's something that's permanently put to the party in the here and now, but it's not necessarily something that the party itself is rapidly engaging with and where that some other parties are in Northern Ireland's politics. Undoubtedly, and in a very practical sense as much as anything, it is something that will continue to pose a challenge um, for the party. And at some point in the future, um, it's recognised that within the party, um, a decision of sorts will need to be reached on that. But for now, it's not something that dominates um, either the party, either in terms of its current identity or its current work and ambitions. And that brings me to my second point. In the context of Northern Ireland's politics, what then is the Alliance Party if it's not about the constitutional question? In our research, we find that three quarters of members see it as an alternative to unionism and nationalism, not as a bridge or a broker for compromises between unionism and nationalism. 78% of members do not identify as either unionist or nationalist, and almost half of members describe themselves as Northern Irish. In other words, party members recognise it as something different in the local politics of this place something which was also prevalent, a prevalent reason cited by members when we asked them why they decided to join the party in the first place. So in a sense, it's already a party that's quite comfortable with the uncomfortable. And as we have seen through elections in recent years, it embraces and is capable of, of harnessing this. The challenge for the party, however, will be how it continues to do this under increasing pressure from all sides of Northern Ireland's political spectrum and under the spotlight of scrutiny on what success means after the alliance surge of recent years. Key to this, and my third and final point, appears to be quite a simple question, but who are the members of the Alliance Party? There'll be a lot of focus on different aspects of this in our work, um, but I'll highlight just a few here. Firstly, it's a male-dominated party. 58% of its members are male. Yet it's a party that has managed to achieve broadly 50-50 representation organically in its election candidates and elect representatives, um, which has had a lot to do with work internally um, and mechanisms behind the scenes to bring this about. It is a party that is generally uncomfortable with the idea of quotas, but that remains open-minded to their potential use in the future, should there be a benefit seen in using these. Approximately 14% of its members identify as being part of the LGBTQ community. Just over 45% of members stated that they are not religious. It's a party with an exceptionally active youth movement that has developed effectively as a feeder uh, of, for new talent coming through the party and achieving elected representation. The largest influx of members has been since 2010, particularly for younger members, and the age profile of the party quite consistently spans all age groups from 18 to 80 plus. Now, the reason that this is significant is that with a party that prioritizes the so-called bread and butter issues, Constitutional dynamics aren't what shapes the party's direction or its party positions on different issues. It's the amalgamation of different outlooks and views that ultimately does this. And Alliance is positioned in quite an unusual way to do this compared to other parties dominating Northern Ireland's political spectrum. Its relationship with the constitutional question and debates, on on debates that are ongoing in that space, particularly in the wake of Brexit, is simply different to th those of other parties on these matters. And whichever way you look at it, and the path that needs to be cut in elections, for example, um, is very different to what other parties can rely upon. So the Alliance Party is operating in a very different space. There are a lot of dynamics within the Alliance Party and within which it is situated that make it a fascinating study of how politics beyond unionism and nationalism in, in Northern Ireland has developed and how it might continue to shape politics here in the future. We hope that this work will contribute towards plugging the gap both here um, in terms of understanding our politics and in wider academia. This has been a really exciting party to watch over recent years and I'm delighted to have been able to play um, just a small part in tracing its path 
And as a team, I know that we are all grateful beyond words to everyone who made it possible for us to take this journey. So we hope you enjoy this evening as much as we will, um, some more than others perhaps, given the look of that drink table over there. Um, and we just want to say that we're always on hand if ever there's anything you want to discuss with us or um, chat about. We are, uh, I think, officially geeks of the Alliance Party um, at this stage. Um, and just to reiterate our, our thanks and appreciation for um, having us and for every opportunity that we've had to engage with you over the last number of years. Um, so I'll pass over to John now um, with some further reflections before we get going with the rest of the evening. So thank you. Thanks, Claire. I will be very brief. Um, we spent two and a half years working on the Alliance Party and then along comes David McCann this morning in the Irish News and says they need a second album anyway. So uh, <laughs> we're redundant, our research is redundant already. Um, thanks ever so much. Just want to echo all the thoughts, uh, all the sentiments that have been expressed by Moira and Claire. We're hugely, hugely grateful to every single party member who either took part in the survey or agreed to be interviewed, often at very considerable length. Um, Sometimes that was our choice, uh, sometimes it wasn't our choice uh, in, in terms of the length. We're really, really grateful for that. Uh, there's only one sort of big party left, so if anyone's from, if anyone here from Sinn Féin, we're, we're open, we're, we're ready, we're ready to go. Um, three very quick points before we move to Sophie, one of the co-authors, is going to chair a, a panel um, of distinguished politicians and academics uh, any moment now. But there's three, it's not just about the membership survey, uh, on this. It's also about a history of Alliance, and it's a really important history, and we were delighted that Oxford University Press was so keen on uh, running with this book, less keen on what, how Oxford University Press have priced the book, but that is beyond our control, I can assure you, on behalf of all the, uh, the author team. The 1970s, what's remarkable is the year that Alliance was born in, because there could hardly be a more unfavourable year for a party that wanted to bridge divisions uh, to be born as Northern Ireland was in many ways tearing itself beginning to tear itself apart alliance is born born in the most unfavorable circumstances you could probably imagine a cross community party being born the second really important historical moment I think for alliance was the backing that you gave to the Anglo-Irish agreement and I'm delighted that John Cushnahan the leader during that period is here with us we interviewed all surviving leaders of, of alliance for the book that was very, very important, I think, in terms of bolstering the Anglo-Irish Agreement Alliance's role what was, was significant. And then you've got the Good Friday Agreement, which obviously Alliance enthusiastically backed as a peace deal, but have and continue to have reservations about the institutional structures associated uh, with that deal. So three his important historical epochs uh, for the party. So what we really want to do now is broaden the discussion, and we want this discussion to be, to be interactive after the panel have each spoken briefly themselves. So I'd li now like to invite uh, Sophie up, who's going to chair this discussion, and each of the panellists. Unfortunately, Saoirse can't be here with us tonight for, for family reasons. She sent a message this afternoon, but I'm delighted to welcome, in no particular order of merit, uh, Alex Kane and Suzanne Breen from the, the very well-known journalists, obviously, and welcome the party leader, Naomi Long up to the stage, and uh, the deputy leader, Owen Tennyson, and Kate Nicholl, uh, MLA. I know Kate's here, so you know where she is, okay. Uh, and they're each going to express their thoughts briefly, and then it'll be open to the floor for yourselves to, to get stuck in in the discussion. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, John's already introduced everyone, so that saved us a bit of time, but we don't have loads of time. Um, so how we're going to run this is we're going to ask all our panellists to reflect on the book, if there are any surprises, um, any criticisms um, of what we've written. Um, so I'll give you three minutes each. I will have to be quite strict, I'm afraid. Um, and then we'll go to Q&A with our audience. Um, so if we're happy, we'll just run in the order that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, was I surprised um, when I read it? Yes, <laughs> I was. It was. It was a couple of years ago. We did these interviews, and um, I was Lord Mayor at the time. And uh, I think I was one of those people who kept you talking for a really long time, John. And then when the transcript came through, I panicked that Naomi was going to kill me. Um, <laughs> I. I am actually really proud of this because I think there's a real honesty in it. Um, I think that uh, 
there's a lot still within it that maybe some other parties would have insisted in, in coming out. Um, and I think it just portrays a party that is confident in, in who it is. Um, and for me, it's really wonderful because I joined in 2012 during the flags protest, which features quite a bit. Um, and I worked for Anna Lowe then. Um, and I've been, she hasn't been well, and I've been thinking about her a lot recently. And I've been thinking a lot about the members and the people who paved the way for us to get to where we are. Um, and I think a lot of the time we talk about the, the 2019 surge and, and the success from then, and uh, a lot of it is to do with Naomi and, and all these other brilliant people. But I, I'm always thinking about the members who, who paved the way and made it so much easier for us today. So um, it's been really interesting to read um, and I think actually really useful for us as a tool, having a better understanding of what our membership think. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> you. Um, I think you've done all of our book launches. So this is a hat trick, I think, for you. I have done all of your yeah, book thank launches. You thank you very much. Again, <laughs> and, and if you can't get Sinn Féin and I'm still alive and not totally bonkers, I'm willing. <laughs> I'm willing to come along and, and at the launch of the book on the TUV. I, I think Jim would really love that. Be, it would please him enormously. I also I, I think one thing I should say, which I've never said publicly, publicly before, my last day of school, the Royal School Armagh, my headmaster, Jim Brennan, who was uh, one of the early members of the Alliance Party outside Belfast, gave me a membership form and told me he thought, um, uh, I'd, I'd done politics A-level, low-level, he said, um, Cian, even, even in the last day, he couldn't call me Alex, but he said, Cian, I think the Alliance Party would be the right party for you. <laughs> I lost the application form. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have been lumbered with me. But I quite like the fact of being annoying you from the inside rather than just from the outside. In, in terms of the, of the, the book itself, it, it's, it, it's as good as the other two. I mean, the, the, the details. For, 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 yeah. See, I, I'm well trained in this, John. I know. I, I know how to insult kindly. No, I, I, I did enjoy it um, enormously. The fourth thing, I'm not going to go into the detail, um, but I think there are four things about the Alliance Party, and I, it'll come up during this. I, I, I was alive when the Alliance Party were born. I've followed it through the years. So, to me, there are four iterations of the Alliance Party. The first period was the from when they were started in 1970, but the key period then was the 1973, that first election, the local government election, when they got almost 14%, and they were the second largest party in Northern It was a huge boost. And for the next few years, right the way through to the 79 general election, the Alliance Party was always just nudging, just under 10%, or going over to 11, 12, 13%. And it did look, it did look as if it was on the cusp of doing something very significant in Northern Ireland politics. And I think that was partly due to the fact that while it was seen as a, a centrist party, it was not seen as a Northern Ireland party of the centre. It was seen as a Northern Ireland party which is at the centre, if you like, of unionism, which was almost a, a gap or a, a bridge or a sandwich, a meter, whatever the metaphor is in these things, between the various sections of unionism. It was never at that time seen as a party, you know, between unionism and nationalism. And then the next iteration was from 80 right the way through until 1998, when in, it never really got, I think with maybe one or two exceptions, it never crossed that 10% barrier again. And it, it spent its whole time trying to find a role, a relevance, a purpose and direction, basically just hanging on in there. And, you know, that, that key period in the, you know, you, you'd mentioned already about the, the support in the anglo irish Agreement, which I think was hugely important and I think is underplayed now. A lot of people have forgotten how important it was to get, uh, a, if you like, not a unionist party per se, but a party which was reckoned to be close to unionism to back that. A particular agreement that was very significant um, and all the way through every time there was a peace process you could always rely on the alliance party so i think it wasn't it's touched upon by someone in the book and i can't remember who that the the 1998 um, result was horrible for the party because at the very time you would have expected people to rally to the party because the, much of the Good Friday Agreement is what the Alliance Party had been saying for the previous 25 years, you know, in terms of how we work together and you're going to have to make difficult compromises, you're going to have to make hugely difficult choices, but it's worth doing. You would have thought at that point people would look and say, this party has been here since 1970, almost 30 years. We will reward them now. And they didn't. You actually had one of those odd results where the Alliance Party got 30,000 less votes in 1998 than it did in 1973, even though there had been a very significant growth in the electoral register. And that must have been a huge problem, internal problem. And I, I think it, it's credit to the, um, I'm going to call it the, the Ford era, you know, that period. The, uh, even though it, I think it was the first three years it wasn't due. 
but it was about keeping the, the party together. Again, almost repeating what you were doing from that 1980 right the way through to 98 period, keeping the party in the ground, keeping it alive. I've been, as someone who's been director of communications for the Ulster Unionist Party, which was kicked around, you know, very hardly, after, or very badly after 1990, I know what it's like the difficulty in trying to keep relevance for a, a, a particular party. And there's one thing I want to say, David, because I think it, 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 it proved significant in terms of what came next. I think when you talked about um, the Alliance Party being agnostic on the union, in terms of, you know, well, we, we, we don't see ourselves as a binary party in that sense. We don't divide ourselves in that sense. There are other things we should be doing. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. It remains part of the United Kingdom until there's a border poll that changes it. In the meantime, let's make Northern Ireland work. But the use of agnosticism in that particular case, I think, took the Alliance Party from an almost pretend centre ground to a real centre ground. Because for years, you, you weren't, the centre was never between unionism and, and and nationalism, the centre in politics is always over here. It's unexplored. It's ground which hasn't had the flag planted on it and saying, this is who we are. This is our identity. This is the difference between us and the other lot. Using that term agnosticism was important because even though it annoyed the hell out of Jamie Bryson, which congratulations, I mean, it, it, it's always good to be able to annoy him. Even I annoy him because I'm not a proper unionist. But Thanks on that point, we might have to... All right, just last point. Just to, <laughs> you mentioned Jamie Bryson. It always closes the bloody conversation. But you get... The last point, which is where, where Naomi came in, because I think it was at the fact that the Alliance Party had re-established itself as a party agnostic on the union, which made it much easier for people who were pro-union, particularly after Brexit, to drift towards Alliance, because they weren't saying we're not unionist or anti-unionist, we're just saying we'll make up our mind when the time comes. That made it easier. It made it easier for people after the protocol as well, who thought the Ulster Unionist Party was too weak, and who thought the DUP had gone clinically bonkers. So, but that agnosticism made it so much easier for people to, to join the alliance, which I think explains the surge. But the surge, I fear, may be plateau territory, which David, I think, was hinting at today. Thanks, Alex. On that happy note, I'll pass on. Yeah, that was more about time to end anywhere else. <laughs> I'm glad I did my job there, Naomi. Well, I'm not as prepared for this event as I should be. Um, I flew back from Portugal from a, a holiday there this morning. And the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland, beyond unionism and nationalism, was packed in my suitcase. But to be honest, it didn't make it out of it. <laughs> There were loads of other distractions and temptations. We were in the most gorgeous little village, almost on the Spanish border of Tavira, and we went to Seville, we were on the beach, we went <laughs> lovely walks, and I was not in the mood for <laughs> reading about Northern Ireland politics. So my apologies to begin with. My knowledge of the Alliance Party goes back decades, a very, very long time, long before I became political editor of the Belfast Telegraph, long before I was a journalist. Alliance has a really strong team of MLAs at Stormont, and we can see with the contest for the deputy leadership of Alliance, the strength and depth of the Alliance team. Owen Tennyson becoming deputy leader of a party at 26, that is really, really some achievement. And Kate was such a strong contestant um, in that election. And, and there was also people very talented and capable like Nilla McAllister and Saoirse Eastwood that didn't stand. And most parties in Northern Ireland would give their right arm to have a, a, a front bench as strong as Alliance. Alliance. Um, like Alex, I do think that the Alliance surge for the moment probably is over. The 17 MLAs, that 2022 result was astounding. The council elections weren't as good, I think, maybe that, that the party hoped for. There wasn't the breakthrough west of the ban that it has really longed for. And I think the Westminster election result was also disappointing. Sorsha Eastwood, you know, really there was a, a phenomenal victory there in taking a seat, um, to take a seat from the DUP to become the first female, first non-unionist MP. But I think if we are being honest, we have to say that the results in North Down and East Belfast were disappointing and the challenge for Alliance in the next Westminster election will be to keep that lag and valley seat. That's something that's pr improved impossible for the party to do. If the party has sense, it will be conducting a post-mortem. 
into those election results and the constituencies where it mightn't have done as well as it hoped for. It won't be complacent and it won't be lazy. There's a number of assembly seats that I think are at risk in the assembly elections, South Down, North Antrim, Upper Ban, the second seat perhaps in Lagan Valley. It's going to be a tough ask for Alliance to hold all those. The party has never lost an assembly seat, but I think it is going to be under pressure in 2027. I think also Claire Hanna's leadership of the SDLP also potentially poses challenges. She's a very different type of politician to Colum Eastwood. Um, the book shows that the SDLP is actually the most popular party among Alliance members. And I think there are some Alliance voters that will be tempted towards a, 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 perhaps just a different tone and style of politician in Clare Hanna. But the most interesting probably part of, of, of the research in the book is, is what Alliance members' views and the constitutional question are. Now, Alliance was never a red, white and blue party, but certainly the party that, that, that I knew growing up, it most definitely was a small U unionist party. Um, the first ever survey of Alliance members showed that 16%, just 16%, supported Irish unity. The figures in this book show 38% support for Irish unity. That's the, the most popular choice among Alliance members. 27% want to maintain the union, and 30% of members don't know, and 4% said they would abstain in a border poll. Now, I'm not saying there are divisions in Alliance, because there aren't, but there are clear differences. Catholics and those of no religion are twice as likely to support Irish unity as are those who joined post-2000. And Protestant members of Alliance are much more likely to support staying in the United Kingdom. Now, the constitutional future of Northern Ireland isn't something that I think Alliance members wake up and think about every morning. It is not their greatest priority. Eight out of ten said that they wouldn't identify as either unionist or nationalist. But just to kind of conclude, I think that when a border poll does come, and it is coming, that it will be a huge challenge for the party because the political debate and conversation in Northern Ireland will centre around that border poll. And, and we could be talking about a two-year period. I think Alliance is likely to decide that it's taking no position and to leave it up to a, a, an, an issue of conscience um, for its representatives. But that, that's also going to pose um, a challenge because if we have an MP or MLAs who take one position and decide they want to go out and campaign to, to, to stay in the union and people who decide no, they don't, they want to campaign for Irish unity, then there are going to be clear divisions there. And during any border poll campaign, you know, things will be forged, alliances will be forged, people on one side will become very close and people on the other side will become very close. Bonds will be created and I think it would be quite hard then if alliance representatives, senior representatives did decide to be part of the campaign on whichever side to come back together as one. We've seen the problems that it caused the, the Tories over Brexit in the UK and you know this is really a heart and soul issue in Northern Ireland. It's, it's absolutely massive so I think Alliance is fine now, it's fine in the years to come, the, the, the immediate future but in the medium term there are challenges for the party when a border poll is called. Thank you. Thanks Suzanne. And, um, I want to say thank you for sharing such personal things as well. Um, what, do you name? What, what do you make of all of that and the book? Um, well, first of all, um, with respect to the book, I suppose just to go back to when this was first posed as a question, it would have been very easy. In fact, it would have been the easiest thing possible to simply say, no, thank you. Uh, we don't want to participate. You can write your book, but we'll not be opening up our doors. We'll not be opening up our membership. We'll not be opening up ourselves um, to this kind of scrutiny um, and, and to this kind of work. Um, and a lot of parties, I would understand, would not want that kind of scrutiny. They wouldn't want their members speaking, you know, off the top of their head and saying what they thought um, and having all that chronicled for the future. The reason that we didn't take that was, I think, uh, there were multiple reasons. One was it was around the time of the, the 50th anniversary of the party being founded. 
And there had never been a serious academic work done about the party, its history, um, what it was about, what made it tick. And that was one thing. Second thing was that any books that had been written about the party were written by party members from a historical perspective about how the party was formed and, and the kind of narrative um, of those times. But they were always written looking backwards. They were reflective. And they weren't written about the contemporary membership of the party and what it stands for now and what it, role it will have in the future. And so for those reasons, I thought it was important and the leadership thought it was important that we did this. I remember speaking to a friend of mine and his son was at school in St. Colm's College in Derry. And he did a project on the Alliance Party. Um, and when he came and spoke to his dad about it, and he did this project on the Alliance Party, and he said when he presented it, some of the boys in his class didn't know anything about the Alliance Party. They had never experienced Alliance and Derry. This was a number of years ago before uh, more recent progress. Um, and he said to me, it's a shame that nobody, like people don't know about it in certain parts of Northern Ireland. But it's also a shame because I think people don't know about it, even in parts where Alliance is, they don't understand what we're about. And I think a book like this helps shine a light on what we're about. So I'm going to just talk about some of the things that I think were positive about the book. People have a perception that if you're not unionist or nationalist, or if you're anti-sectarian, or if you're any of the things that we want to be across community call the way you wish, you're bland and dull and boring and you avoid difficult talk topics and you don't have rows and discussions and debates and you're very demure and you all just keep quiet to get along. Well, I think the book will make very clear that's not who we are. Um, we're very opinionated. We hold very strong, often divergent opinions on lots and lots of issues. But what differentiates us, I think, from other parties is that our democratic strength is that we come together, we debate, we look at the evidence, we make decisions, and we stick to those decisions based on the evidence. And that's why I'm less fearful and less pessimistic than the last two speakers about the future of Alliance. Because the same approach, I mean, for example, there's nothing more divisive in Northern Ireland than the question of abortion. And the party has navigated over the last 50 plus years our position on that in terms of giving people a freedom of conscience vote. I remember one of the first big interviews I did, actually for the Belfast Telegraph, I, I think you were involved in the interview, and it was interviewing me and interviewing Anna Lowe, and contrasting and comparing our position on abortion. And Anna and I went back into the assembly the next day and worked together because we knew we had slightly different approaches to the issue. And we knew it was a matter of conscience. I never curtailed Anna in terms of her position. I never, she never curtailed me in terms of my position, but we did debate and discuss it. And I have to say that my position and her position changed over time because we got to understand better where each of us were coming from and we could see merit in some of the things that the other person was saying. And so actually that debate and discourse is often robust. I think if some people went to our party councils, they would be quite shocked at how robust the debate can be at times, but it's always respectful. It's always courteous, and it is debate amongst friends who are united by something bigger. And that is the belief that what people share in Northern Ireland together is greater than what divides us. And I, I think that is a theme that runs through the book. The other thing I would say is that people will assume that if you're in alliance, um, that that in some ways you, you must be secretly something else. You must be secretly a unionist or a nationalist, that it's impossible in Northern Ireland to be a true neutral, that you can't come, and, and the book tells us two things. One is that that's kind of true, in the sense only that how we're raised colours how we view the constitutional question. Suzanne pointed to it. The, the, the religious divide in Northern Ireland does, even within alliance, affect people's um, long-term aspirations to some degree or their openness to those aspirations. But it also shows that there are true neutrals. Eight out of 10 people are not unionist or nationalist. When you ask people to rate the issues that were their priorities, it didn't, it didn't turn up in their top 10. They're not, it's not a pretense of neutrality for political expediency. It is a genuine lack of prioritization in individual people's lives about where they see the future of this place and our people. And the third thing I would say is that people sometimes think that when you're in politics, it's always um, about how to attack other people and, and that, that, that that's you're always positioning yourself, if you like, relative to others. 
But this actually talks about being beyond unionism and nationalism. And what used to grind my gears, and I am the new generation, or was, till he came along. And when I came into the party in the 90s, it used to grind my gears that we were seen as being between unionism and nationalism. So instead of alliance defining itself, this is where we stand. People defined us by unionism is here, nationalism is here, you're between them. And the reason I like this book is because it talks about us being beyond that. We're not between them. We do not, we do not, we do not triangulate our position off where other people are. We take our position based on what we think is right for all the people of Northern Ireland, what is in their best interests, what we believe will give us the, most po the, the best possible future. And many of those positions would be the same, whether they were taken in the context we're in now in the United Kingdom, or whether they were taken in the context of a United Ireland. Because we're not triangulating off those points. We're saying, this is where we believe the future of, of our people lies, our people. Not a constitutional entity, but our people. And for me, that's the most important thing that comes through in the book, that the things that do matter to Alliance are the things that matter to people. They're the things that change their lives. They're the things that make their lives better. They're the things that make their communities more comfortable and inclusive. They're the things that really do waking people up in the middle of the night concerned, not the constitutional question, but how to pay their bills, how to make our environment better. All of those things are the things that drive us. And I like the idea of being beyond unionism and nationalism, not between. There was a time for between, but I think we're beyond that time. And I hope that people like Owen and others, uh, when it comes to them writing other chapters of this story, uh, we'll be able to look at what that beyond is going to look like for the next 50 years. Um, but for me, in this phase, I'm very clear that where we go next is about growth, because I'm not convinced the surge is over. But like any wave, it crashes on shore, it recedes, and then it comes back stronger. The tide is still coming in. No pressure, Owen. <laughs> Quite an act to follow, as always. Um, no, look, I, I think I'm struck, actually, by how similar Kate's and Naomi's reflections were to, to my own when I was reading the book. I wasn't necessarily surprised by the content. As somebody in the party who knows a lot of the characters, I was surprised how open some of them were at times, and I'm sure our head of press is having a meltdown at the back somewhere, worrying about what everybody has said. But I think as you reflect through the different perspectives and views that people have on social issues, on the constitutional debate, and as you reflect on all of the changes that have happened through the various chapters of the Alliance story, there is that one theme um, that unites our, our members and the people who support us. And that is that vision of a truly united community where people can live at peace with themselves and their neighbors free from discrimination and harm. And that is why I don't accept that the surge is over. Because I think that vision was radical in 1970, and I'm looking at Jim, um, when people like Jim from right across our community came together in some of the darkest days of the Troubles. And it is as, as relevant today as we look um, to political parties still sitting down um, with representatives of paramilitary organizations, where we reflect on a community um, where our children are still largely educated apart, where our, our people are growing up um, in communities that are divided still along sectarian lines. I was born, and I like to remind Naomi of this all the time, I was born in 1998, just before the agreement was signed. And Naomi hates it every time I bring it up. And I, I still grew up in a community where my community background dictated where I went to school, who my friends were, what football teams I could support. Um, and that was supposed to shape my political identity too. And I never understood that hard mentality and refused to be defined by it. And it was when I went to university, and I'm always struck because Naomi tells a similar story of when she went to university and experienced a united and integrated community for the first time at Queen's. And I had that exact same experience many years later. <laughs> and, and children and young people today are still having that same experience. And for me, that is why I don't think the surge is over because that mission of building that truly united community hasn't been completed, and I think only this party can deliver it. Um, 
thanks everyone. Sorry, my timekeeping went a bit lax, but everyone was making such um, really interesting points. Um, we're going to go to Q and A now um, with our audience. If you have a question, please put your hand up. Um, could you say who it's aimed at? If it's aimed at a particular member of our panel, and can I ask that you ask questions rather than make comments because we've only got so much time. So, um, what have we got? Like 10, 15 minutes for questions right. till eight. Okay. And Moira's got a mic, fab. Um, and she's wearing flat shoes just for this purpose. <laughs> just to run around. Is there any, can I take any questions? Gosh, I thought they'd be... Uh, one of my seminars with my students, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're always talking. Anyone got any questions? Please don't be shy. Please, thank, thank, say your name. Thank you for being um, for questions. <laughs> yeah, just like Owen, I went to university in 1970 and I've experienced exactly the same thing that he is talking about. And I'm one of those members who joined in 1970. One thing I, I want to ask about is this view that we're going to split over, over the constitutional position. I think that one of the things that struck me in the book is that it isn't there is how, in fact, this party faced a series of challenges through its time. It faced internment, in which case the Protestant members were in favor of internment, and yet the party was against it. And the party convinced those Protestant members and increased its growth through that. It faced Bloody Sunday, and similarly... I'm really got, sorry to interject, but can got, get to got the question? Through, got through. The point I'm making is we faced a series of challenges and got through them. We will face the, any challenge that comes. We will discuss it and we will get through it. Do you not think that that is also about our growth? Thank you. Um, I think we'll take a couple more if that's yes, okay. Yes, that's okay. Yeah. Um, is there any more? Is there any more? Yes, Cohen. Oh, give me a second. I, I wore my flats, Cohen. So I can run. Give me a second. Sorry. Um, so my name's Cohen. This is very odd in this very echoey room, um, using a mic. So I study social policy here at Ulster, and I suppose my question was specifically about the United Community designation, and if we could hear a little bit about where that came from. Anyone else? Thank you, Cohen. Um, any a third question at this point? Would be wonderful. Thank oh, you. Oh, we've got one at the front. Oh, we've got one. At, we've got. We'll take three, Sophie. We've got four questions, so I'll come to you. You're good. Oh dear. So I'll come to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Philip McGuire is active in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, it's great that the Alliance is doing really remarkably well at the present time. Clearly, we've got a lot of support from the UUs and SDLP type of voters. However, unfortunately, they have shrunk. Them. They've lost support also on the other side. So the support now for what you may call the broad centre would be is significantly less than it was even in 1998. And I suppose a strong alliance would, I, would benefit from having uh, SDLP and unionists on either side reasonably strong with less support for the more extreme parties. And I wonder if that is an issue because alliance will not be able to do it all on its own. And are there ways maybe when those three broad centre parties might perhaps offer a vision or a sense of common values maybe uh, more strongly? And would that be helpful? Um, does anyone want to tackle those? Amy, I feel like. Yeah, there are a couple of things. Um, first of all, where did, this, where did the United Community designation come from? Uh, David's smiling because it kind of came from us. Um, we had initially signed in, um, well, you're technically in the, in the agreement. David is a pedant, I'm just going to say that up front, so you understand this conversation. This is the kind of debates we have in the party. So in the Good Friday Agreement, it says unionists with a capital U, nationalists with a capital N, and lowercase, uh, and other with lowercase. So David made the compelling point that we didn't actually need to write other. We could choose whatever other we wanted. And under Sean, we wrote centre, I think is correct. 
and I hated that because this again was this triangulation of where everybody else, because if everybody lurches to the far right, suddenly you become right wing if you're center. If everybody goes to the far left, you're, you're center left. And I'm like, we're not center, we're something else. And the United Community thing came from David saying, we need to say what we are in positive terms, not in the absence of a uh, unionist nationalist identity. And that's where that came from. And it kind of has defined, because it captured what we were about. The other point's the one um, that Philip raised. Um, and I, I just, I'm going to mention this because I think it's pertinent. You talked about David wasn't the leader during the whole piece after the Good Friday Agreement. Sean Neeson was for a few years, and I know Sean's very ill at the moment, but Sean was for that period, and during that period we suffered probably our biggest electoral tests that, that we faced. Like our vote percentage dropped to 2% in the European election. And as a result of that, um, Sean commissioned a president's review, and Philip was president at the time, and I was the gobby newcomer who had been given out about all that we were getting wrong. So I got myself a job going around with Philip and going to all the associations and finding out um, what we needed to do. And that's why I put you on the last review because you were the new gobby newcomer. But um, so th when we did all that, and we, we, we went around and we, ha we had those conversations and that's how the party survived, because we took a critical look at ourselves. And we do that after every election, so we don't get complacent. Even at a good election, we go back and go, what could we have done better? Because if you don't do that, you'll not, you'll not thrive. I would challenge you to listen back to Hansard for some of the debates this week and tell me that the Ulster Unionists are more centrist than the DUP in terms of some of the statements that Steve Aiken and others made in the chamber. This idea that there's moderate unionism, moderate nationalism versus extreme unionism and extreme nationalism, I actually think was of a time, Philip, and it's not to be disrespectful, but actually on many issues, Sinn Féin can be more moderate and more progressive on, on some of those issues than their SDLP counterparts. And definitely more pronounced, I would have to say, the Ulster Unionist swing anywhere from close to alliance to off the scale with the TUV. So the idea that you could position us with common values with them, we probably could do it, and it's probably the reason why the SDLP is, that's, if you like, the, the second most liked party of our own membership. You could probably do it more easily with the SDLP, not because people are more nationalist leaning, but because we have a more similar approach in that we're just that, bit kinder in how we do our politics in some of the other parties and uh, uh, we tend to treat each other with more respect. I don't think that that paradigm of the extremes then the center that bridges across actually works anymore. The things that will unite us with other parties isn't where we stand on the unionist nationalist spectrum. It's going to be where we stand on social issues, where we stand on implementation of the Windsor framework, where we stand on how we actually deliver better services in our community. And we will make different allegiances on different issues, but I don't think we will be permanently united back into this kind of centre ground territory. Because as I say, I don't think we're centre. I think we're beyond that, we're progressive. And what we will do is work in progressive alliances with other parties on the issues where they agree with us. Thanks very much. Um, Alex, did you want to say something? Yes, um, I, I just wanted to uh, touch partly on the first question, which will the alliance party split on the uh, a border poll issue. And I, I take your point that it didn't split over internment and some other issues. Big difference was that the party was small then. And small parties tend not to split. I think in this particular one, when you come to a border poll, and it's fine, I take Naomi's point, you know, it, it, she says it, it, it's possible not to be neutral, you don't have to be a unionist, you don't have to be a nationalist. I'm not sure, I, I take the point when you don't have a border poll, but if the, if the stage comes, which I think is likely, I don't think a border poll is going to be announced in the next two or three years, but I think it's very likely that the British and Irish governments will set in stone the terms and conditions for that border poll. And once those terms and conditions are set in stone, once we know the exact circumstances in which a Secretary of State would call a border poll, then all bets are off. Because all those people who are, you've taken people, we know from the, 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 the stats that uh, people who used to be in the Ulster Unionist Party and quite comfortable in the Ulster Unionist Party for a variety of reasons have drifted to alliance. And I accept that point. Once you say to people, the next choice you have to make, with which for many of you will be the most important political choice you will make in your life, is the constitutional issue. Do you want to remain in the United Kingdom 
or do you want to go into a united Ireland? At that point, Naomi, at that point, this thing about the luxury of saying, well, we're not unionist, we're not nationalist, we're not this, we're not that. And the point about will it split? It will split on that. It's not a luxury, it's a right. Oh, it's a right, but I'm just saying. It's not a luxury. You know, okay, it's a right. The right to say you're not unionist right now, the right to say you're not nationalist. I'm not sure that right will be as, as strong if you have a situation where the government is saying there's going to be a border poll. Decide which way your party is going to vote. Decide which way your members are going to vote. And you will have meetings, Naomi, with people who say, look, I was quite happy with the neutral position until this moment came. I am a unionist. I want to live in the United Kingdom. I'm a nationalist. I want to see United Ireland. And I don't know how you're going to handle it. It's going to be enormously difficult. I'm just simply saying that the notion that the alliance could avoid a split on something as crucial, fundamental and existential as that question just strikes me as absurd. Amy, I know you want to come back on It's that. crucial, fundamental and existential with all due respect if you're a unionist or a nationalist. So that's the problem. You're in a we'll different space. A no, no hold we'll on. You're in a different space, Alex. Do you know what was existential for Alliance? Brexit. Because being European really mattered to our people. And that was our big challenge. And we handled that. There were people in the party who were skeptical around how Europe operated. But we made that in the same way we make every other challenge. But it's not existential for us. If you look, the people who left the Ulster Unionists and joined Alliance, you presume that there are now the people in Alliance who are more unionist leaning. The evidence doesn't actually stack up. Some of those people, because of Brexit, are now more open to the concept of a united Ireland. So it's a flawed analysis that you're taking away from the book, actually, by suggesting that people who moved from unionism to Alliance did it because they were comfortable with the neutrality but wouldn't be happy going further. Some of the people I speak to in the party, who I would have said were probably more unionist leaning in the past are now not because Brexit has transformed them. So the idea that you can't, for example, I mean, Will very carefully, I think, set out the issue of how people were able to bring other members of the party with them. And we know how we will deal with it. We've been open about it. The first thing we will do as a party, if there is a border poll, is we will say, are we going to take a position as a party or are we going to leave it to, to our voters to decide for themselves and not campaign and our members to decide? And if we decide to campaign, and I actually di I differ from others, I think we probably will um, because we're very political, um, then we will have a debate and we will decide whether or not we're going to take that position and, and, and what it's going to be. And we will thrash that out and we will talk about the pros and cons and we'll look at the evidence and we'll do all of that. The other thing I wanted to say, which I think is really, really important, during your initial contributions, both you and Suzanne mentioned the issue of when this becomes the only topic of debate at an election. Name me the last election when the border question hasn't been the main topic of debate. It overshadows every election we have ever fought from the party was founded right to the last elections. And the truth is we have navigated every one of them. The things that have been actually more difficult, and this is where I think the book is fascinating, it's the more comfortable people are actually the harder it is for Alliance to do well. It is at times of real discomfort. So when the party was founded, it was a seminal moment. It was also um, during those really difficult periods when it was things were tough. When the assembly wasn't working and we had solutions, people were interested. The, the issue for us isn't about when the tough questions come up. The issue is about when people get comfortable with the status quo. Um, we're not in that space right now, which is why I think there's still opportunities. Oh, and I know you gave me a wave and Suzanne, so do you... Yeah, it was just to say, I think people outside of Alliance view the potential for a border poll as an existential crisis for Alliance in a way that our membership and our elected representatives don't. And I actually think that we have a really important role to play in that conversation, and we often get chastised for, for sitting on the fence. My first answer is always, no, we're about dismantling the fence, but we don't have our head in the sand. We know that there's a life to be happening about, for example what the criteria should be, and we, we, we have views on that, we have engaged with governments on that in the past. But where we differ, I think importantly from the other parties, is we are led on, on the evidence and on our values. So we know sitting here tonight what the Ulster Unionists and the DUP will do in any border poll. We know sitting here tonight what Sinn Féin and the SDLP will do, irrespective of the prevailing circumstances, the arguments about the finances, about the economic headwind, and all of those things, and actually, Whilst our politics looks very polarised based on election results, when you look at a polling in terms of what voters from across the spectrum prioritise, it's health, it's the cost of living, it's their ability to get a good job and keep a roof over their head, and that is where any border poll 
will be won or lost. And that's the role that Alliance can play because we will be weighing up that evidence. And I actually agree with Naomi. I think depending on the circumstances, it's possible we, we don't take a position and we allow a free vote. It's happened before. The Tories did it during the Brexit referendum and initially it didn't do them any harm. They said about what happened next, the better. Um, but also, it is absolutely an option for Alliance to look at the evidence, weigh it up in the, in the prevailing circumstances, and to take a position and to provide leadership. Um, because we're all very opinionated people, and I think a lot of us would struggle um, not, not, not to express a view. But it's a hypothetical question the, at the minute. My question now in the conversation I want to be involved in is, what actually is the proposition? That is the question. It's not, do you prefer a United Ireland or the United Kingdom? It's, what is the proposition? And that is the conversation that this party is engaged in. In terms of, lastly, this idea that the surge is over because issues around Brexit are subsiding in the public consciousness and issues around Stormont being down are, are starting to subside. That is a nonsense. Um, because we have seen, since the Assembly came back, the need for reform of the institutions to enable government to deliver. But also, we prioritise bread and butter issues. And again, if you look at what the public prioritise, it's health transformation, it's the economy. And our strongest arguments, I would argue, are on those issues. So I'm optimistic for the future and the potential to grow the party even further on that basis. Thanks, Ellen. Suzanne, I know you want to come back. And Kate, did you want to say something as well? Um, and, and Sophie, we have at least two tiny questions from the floor, so... Well, I'm happy staying here, but... Oh, well, I know we all are here. happy, but... Okay. Yeah, but I, I, I also know people need to get home, and I know John, and we also have a question from the back, and I, I, that's it then, because no one else put their hands up, so I can't see any other hands, so two, we have two more questions. Okay, Suzanne, did you want to... I, I'm, I'm just going to be brief. Um, I know it's been said that Alliance have had divisions over other issues, that have been problematic like abortion or internment, but the future of Northern Ireland and the future of this state is much, much more. It is not a single issue. There is so much that is connected to it. The health outcomes, the economic outcomes, how much money people have in their pockets, the cost of living. There are real differences in terms of whether Northern Ireland continues to exist, whether it remains part of the UK, or whether we have Irish unity. This, th there's just so many connected issues. Brexit has meant that if, if, if Northern Ireland stays part of the UK, they're out of the EU. If there's an Irish unity, we're back in, in, in the EU. So th there are massive, massive issues. If Alliance takes a position, as Naomi and Owen are indicating that it would be their preference to take a position on a border poll, if Alliance takes a, 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 a position that, that, that we should stay in the union, then you know, what are the 38% of members who believe in Irish unity? Are they going to be happy? Or are they going to say, no, we, we agree with Alliance on a lot of things, but this is such a major issue, we can't stay. If Alliance decides to campaign for Irish unity, well, the party has two MLAs in East Belfast, two out of five. You can't tell me that 40% of the electorate in East Belfast would be happy with Alliance campaigning for Irish unity. And that's why I think there are major challenges for the party when a border poll is called or about to be called. And I, I don't think any amount of smooth words or spinning can get around that. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions, I think, like super quick questions, and then we'll. Um, I don't know what time we have. Lucy. Lucy. Hi, my name's Lucy. Um, I was born in 1972, and I'm a lifelong supporter of the Alliance Party, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about the constitutional question, and I'm, I'm glad to hear Owen's uh, comments, you know, a bit more sort of uh, prepared to grasp the nettle by the thorn, because I think it's not just about. It's about the future and what's the future for this place. And what I would really like to see the Alliance Party doing is talk about beyond uh, nationalism and unionism. What about beyond a united Ireland and beyond uh, the, the union? What about other options? Uh, I think I would like to see on the ballot paper three options. I'd like to see, or multiple options, united Ireland, union, and other options. Uh, so. Uh, I would love it if the intelligent people in this room could start thinking about what, <laughs> what are the other options? Give us some more choices, please. 
Thank you. I think there was one more question. Thank you. Um, and John. Oh, Sorry, it has to be phrased as a question, so I'll ask it of Naomi and Alex Kane. I was glad you mentioned Sean, which you did at the conference, because he is very, very ill have spoken to him. He intended coming here tonight. Uh, 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 but would you not agree that there are some people, and I'm not criticizing those who wrote the book, who maybe didn't get the credit they justly deserve? That is, both Sean and Seamus Close, who were the key negotiators, the absolutely key negotiators for the Alliance Party in the Good Friday Agreement. And going back to the origins of the party, I would like to see the party uh, website reflect that. David Cook doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, the first party headquarters was in his house, and he did, a, did an excellent job as deputy leader. Uh, and and uh, the, um, I think that should be, and Robin Glendinning was the first party organizer. And this is at the time when the party had nothing on the ground. So would you not agree, because it has to be asked the question, Therefore, people. Therefore, people who should got more credit. And I'm not criticising because it's a question of how long ago it was. Yeah. It's like a second volume, maybe. Yeah. Isn't yeah. It? Okay. Um, I'm just going to. Kate, um, did you want to come back on the the United Ireland or beyond um, United Ireland? Yeah, I mean, the, I I feel like I just need to make a final pitch that I don't think people understand necessarily what being an alliance member means to us. So when you look at the, the issues that are prioritized, the constitutional question is, is, is far down. It doesn't mean people don't have a national identity, and it doesn't mean that people within our party aren't confident in who they are. But how we decide policy, it isn't, it isn't determined by other parties' positions or where we'll fit and what will actually be electorally advantageous. It's based on our values and it's based on evidence. And that consistency, I think, is, is why we've grown. Whatever the context of a border poll, we are going to have those conversations. We're going to have that engagement. There may be people who have views right now on uh, and who gave their opinion on whether they're pro-union or pro-United Ireland. Whatever the context of a border poll, that could very well change. What we will do as a party is we will engage. Our members will feel listened to. They will have the opportunity to, to make their voices heard. It will be discussed robustly. And then whatever is agreed, the party will, will be united on that. Of course, in any issue, and you see it with equal marriage or with abortion, or there may be a few members who are at odds with that. But generally, my feeling as a member and, and engaging with other members is that we're part of something that is so important and so much bigger than anything else. And whatever the future, we're going to have to share this place. And so our role within politics is always going to matter. So I, I think people who are not within Alliance, it's a much bigger issue, honestly, for us. It's not. And whenever that day comes, we'll be able to confidently deal with it. Um, I know Naomi and Alex has a question specifically to you. Do you have like, can you do it in like, 30 seconds each. I can. I just, two things I want to say. Yes, there are, of course, people who don't necessarily get credit. Some of that is to do, I think, with people's lived memories and, and all of that. And I think that's why books like the one that Jim Hendren wrote that kind of sets out the history of the party and so on are so important. And this book will be important for, for similar reasons. But yes, I mean, I actually think Sean was quite brave. He never wanted to be leader. It was not something that he ever wanted to do. He took over the party in the, in the aftermath of... Uh, really difficult election where we had hoped that we would do better than six and then we went to five because we lost somebody as speaker and it was a difficult time and um, it was a fractious time um, and he led us through it and I credit to him because if it hadn't been for him taking over at that time we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about the last 20 odd years so I really do think that there are people like that that we do need to acknowledge and I hope we do that in a way that's appropriate the other thing that I wanted to say is this that I get the point Suzanne makes. We'd forty percent of people in East Belfast be happy with with a, a party ca that campaigned for a United Ireland. Well, you know, people weren't happy with me um, and with the party when we made a decision on designated days for the Union flag, but it didn't influence the decision we made. We made it based on the evidence. We made it based on the legal advice. We made it based on our values and our vision for the future. And you know, I, yes, I want success for this party, and I'm ambitious for its future. But I'm ambitious for the people we represent. That's why I want us to be successful. And if we have to sacrifice some of our success to do the right thing, we've never been afraid to do it in the past and we won't be afraid to do it in the future. Success is great, but it's only good if it's bringing betterment to the people we represent. So there'll be no lack of courage when it comes to these discussions in Alliance. There will be no fearfulness about what it might do to our electoral base. If that's how other parties make their decisions. If I might be so bold to say, if you look at some of their fortunes, 
fortunes maybe less time looking at the polls and more time listening and thinking about the future of the people they represent might get them more success Alex, final just a very, very quick point. I, I, I completely agree with you, John, I think. But I think in, in fairness to the authors, this is not, if you like, a history of the particular parties. And, and certainly in the Ulster Unionist Party, there were a number of people that I was very close to who played crucial roles, not only at the time of the agreement, but going way, way back at the time of the, the, the original 1973 white paper, which a lot of people forget the Ulster Unionist Party backed a year after the par their parliament, what they saw their parliament going, they backed the white paper, which would have meant power sharing. You know, when, and people forget the Ulster Unionist Party moved that quickly. But uh, uh, Jim Henman has a book about the history of the party. That's what, what you do. But yeah, I think it's just the nature of these books that some of the most important people are forgotten, not because the party's decided to forget them, but because the party itself, the, these books reflect the party as it is now, not necessarily the people who were responsible for creating the party in the first place. But yeah, a lot of key people, including two I know, <laughs> barely get a mention in this. Yeah. On that note, um, thank you for being a lovely audience and joining us here tonight. Um, I think you will all agree that was an amazing panel. We've kind of gone over, but I didn't want to interrupt because it was all just really brilliant stuff. Um, so can we thank Owen, Naomi and Kate, the Dream Team, the Alliance Dream Team. And also um, Alex, <laughs> Alex and Suzanne as Lots well. That's a sniper. <laughs> so thank you for, for joining me. Um, and can I encourage you to stay for a drink as well? And uh, we have books as well if anyone uh, wants to get any Christmas presents. Maybe not um, holiday reading, <laughs> but maybe Christmas presents. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.